Um, can I ask that they turn up the house lights a little? I just want to be able to see if people are leaving. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here, and there's a couple of logistical things. One is we have a bunch of ballot petitioners here in South Carolina and some from Georgia who are going to come up, I think, at the end of my talk, and uh, I want to identify them so that you can see them. And those of you who have not signed the petition, if you can try to sign it tonight, we need to get you know, sufficient ballots both in here, both petitioners here and in Georgia to get me on the ballot in both states. So I'm going to let you see what they look like and, and, uh, and thank the volunteers for doing it. If you want to sign up as a ballot uh, petitioner to help us get enough ballots in these states, please do so tonight. And you can look at them, you'll, under, you'll, you'll see who to approach. And the other thing is that I'm going to do a selfie line afterwards. So any of you who want to take a, a selfie picture um, with me, then you can, and we'll do that. We'll do it very, very quickly. This is, uh, we did, we did uh, 600 people in 20, 23 minutes in Charleston. So if everybody cooperates, this looks like a very young crowd and, and uh, energetic, so we may be able to make a record tonight. Uh, but again, I want to thank all of you here, and I'm glad to see so many young people here. We've had three polls come out in the last three weeks that have been really fantastic for this campaign. Uh, the Quinnipiac poll, which came out about two and a half weeks ago, showed me at 22 percent. And then, a, uh, um, uh, and then the, the Harvard-Harris poll, which is Mark Penn's outfit, the gold standard poll, showed 22% also nationwide and showed me at young people under 36 years of age that I'm 10 points ahead of President Trump and President Biden, which is extraordinary. And then, the, uh, and then the, the New York Times Siena poll, which is a very, very powerful poll. A lot of the national polls are about 700 to 1,000 people. The Harvard poll, I mean, the New York Times poll, I think it was 3,600, there were over 3,000 people, so it was a really a very, very strong sampling. And that showed that in the eight battleground states that show me a, an average of 24%. With 20, and, and remember, all I have to do is to get to about 37%, because you just need a plurality. and It's winner take all with the electoral votes, so I need to get to 270 electoral votes. I don't even need to win majorities. I just need to get up to about 37%. And that will put me ahead of the other two contenders. And if I can do that in certain enough states, I can, you know, I will win. Uh oh. And we have 12 months to do that. So I'm at be in better shape than any independent for 100 years since Teddy Roosevelt. And it's because of young people. In that last poll, I not only take 18 to 34, but everybody under 45 years old, I win against both Trump and Biden. So I'm climbing up. I have momentum. I have, the, I have 30, I think 36 percent of the independent vote. The two key metrics are young people and independents, and I win both of those. I am in very, very good shape to win this election. And, and people have asked me, why do you think you're doing so well with young people? And the reason for that to me is obvious, and I'm the only one who's talking about what's happening to young people in this country. And my, my father used to say that the future, the the, the promise of a nation, the present promise of a nation, can be measured by the current prospects of its young people. And today the current prospects of our young people are, are the lowest they've ever been in our history, not only because the health of young people is, is, a, is a cataclysm. We have now at least 
54% of young people suffering from chronic disease. When my uncle was president, it was 6%. Yeah. It's probably around 60% now. The last time they tested was in 2006. It went from 6% in 1960 to 11.8% had chronic disease in 1986. By 2004, it was 54%, and NIH stopped publishing that data because they do not want us to know how many young people are sick. And this is the sickest generation in history, and nobody's talking about it except for me. Nobody's talking about it. And if you're young, you look around and ask yourself, how many people do you know that have autoimmune disease? How many have peanut allergies? How many have food allergies? When I was your age, I didn't know a single person who had a peanut allergy. I didn't know, have a, know a single person who had autoimmune disease. I, didn't, I hardly knew anybody. I can't remember a single person who had neurological diseases. You know, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tics, Tourette's syndrome, narcolepsy, ASD, autism. I didn't know anybody. And today, I doubt if there's anybody here who's under the age of 25 who doesn't have friends who are in those categories. And something is wrong, and nobody's talking about it. And we need to address this problem. But, but also, the, the equally important, the financial prospects of young people in this country have never been worse. And um, there was a poll that was taken in 2013 that showed that among people 18 to 34 years old, 85% of them said they were proud to be, uh, they were proud of the United States of America. The same poll taken a month ago showed that only 18% are proud of the United States of America. So some, somehow, in the terms of the last two presidents, the young people of this country have completely lost faith in the United States of America and lost any hope for their own futures. And that, to me, is the most heartbreaking data point that I've seen since I began running in this campaign. And why is that happening today? It's because the American dream, particularly the housing issue, the, you know, the, when I was a kid, it was just one of the central granite foundations of the American dream, that if you worked hard, if you played by the rules, you could finance a home. You could take a summer vacation. You could raise a family. You could put money aside for your retirement on one job. There is nobody in this generation that believes that that applies to them. And they feel betrayed by our generation, and they have been betrayed. You know, I was in San Francisco. Um, I was there a week ago, but I was there about almost a month ago. And I, I spent almost a year in San Francisco in 2018 trying the Monsanto cases. So we tried three cases in a row. We, had, we came in with about, about 2,000 cases, I think 2,400 cases, my firm, and of people who said that they had gotten non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from using Roundup. And the way that multi-district litigation works is that you gather a lot of cases and then you go get them in front of a judge. You get them all consolidated in one court and then you try them one at a time until the defendant gives up and comes to the negotiating table. So the first case, we won $289 million from the jury. The second case, we won $89 million from the jury. The third case, we, there was a young kid trying that case, 35 years old. He was, the, he was the lead counsel in our group. And it was his job to give the closing argument. And the night before you give the closing argument, every, all the different firms sit at a table and we're arguing about how much should we ask this jury. And we've been watching that jury now for weeks and trying to get a feel about what they will give us. And you don't want to ask too much because the jury may punish you for overreaching. So we all suggested we had a consensus we should ask for $300 million because we won $289 million the first time. This kid who was, you know, had been interacting with the jury for weeks said, I'm going to ask him for a billion dollars. 
And we all said, you can't do that. And we tried to talk him out of it. But he's like the captain of the ship. He makes the decision. He asked them for a billion. And we were all biting our nails. And the jury came back with 2.2 billion. Oh. Uh, and, and then Monsanto came to the table. They settled the, you know, all of the cases for $13 billion. And then they removed Roundup from, from home gardening because all of our clients were home gardeners. And um, so I was there for three weeks or for, you know, the better part of the year trying these cases. And every morning before court, I would go to the gym at, in Union Square. And Union Square in San Francisco is like Fifth Avenue in New York. It's, the, it's where all of the big, you know, the big uh, flagship stores are for the American brands like Nordstrom's and, and Bloomingdale's and Macy's and Gap and Old Navy and Levi and all the big foreign brands like Gap, like Gucci and De La Valle and Prada and uh, Burberry and Ferragamo and they, all of these giant stores there. Well, when I went back a month ago, all of those stores were closed. Oh, it's just acre after acre of plywood. It's like as if all of Fifth Avenue shut down. People come from all over the world to shop there, and it's gone. The, the economic heart of that city has been torn out. And it was such a traumatic experience for me seeing this. I love San Francisco. It's the most beautiful city in our country. It's my favorite city. And um, so I, I started studying homelessness because I didn't know much about it. So I, I started reading the books. My son, Connor, who's 28 years old and just graduated law school, he gave me, um, he turned me on to a writer called Matthew Desmond. And Matthew Desmond has written a seminal work on homelessness, which is called Evicted. It's a best-selling book. But he's done all of these studies, and he did them with the University of San Francisco. And he went out and actually he interviewed with this big team from the University of San Francisco. He interviewed thousands of homeless in San Francisco. And he gave questionnaires to them. And I, when I approached this issue, I came in with a series of assumptions and biases. And one of those was that homelessness was a feature ultimately of drug addiction. I also thought it's also linked to a mental illness and to extreme poverty. And also, I assumed that a lot of the people who were homeless in San Francisco had gone homeless somewhere else, like Detroit or New York, and they didn't want to sleep in the snowstorm on the grates. So they moved, they, take the, they used their last couple of bucks and take a bus to San Francisco. And San Francisco is, of course, a better climate, but also a famously generous social service system. I'd also heard from many people in San Francisco that police in towns like Austin and Dallas, when they arrest a homeless person, when they pick them up, instead of bringing them to the county jail, they put them on a Greyhound to San Francisco with a one-way ticket. A lot of people in San Francisco believe that. So what Desmond's study shows is that the people who are homeless in San Francisco are from San Francisco overwhelmingly. So they didn't come from somewhere else. He also shows that there's parts of this country, like West Virginia and Detroit, which have much higher levels of drug addiction, but they don't have homelessness problems. And he also, and, and they also have much higher levels of poverty. San Francisco is the wealthiest city in our country. He also shows that, yes, many people who are homeless are mentally ill, but overwhelmingly, they became mentally ill after they became homeless. And he shows that um, you're, a after only three days on the sidewalk, your psyche begins to deteriorate, to disintegrate. And um, what he says, and he shows with data, is that the one correlation to homelessness is housing prices. And California has the highest housing prices in the country. And he, what Desmond says is that this epidemic that we see of homelessness in San Francisco is building like a tsunami and is about to 
roll across our country and bring the same level of homelessness, but also the same levels of, of disintegration. The reason all these places shut down is because of the chaos on the street, because people don't want to shop there anymore because there's these homeless encampments everywhere. And that, that same phenomena is about to happen to the rest of the country because the price of housing is skyrocketing like nothing else. And of course, everything is touched by inflation. The food prices, child care, health care, everything that we do. But nothing, and that's because, you know, we all know why that is, because $8 trillion we've spent on regime change wars that have been absolutely useless for our country. And then the $24 trillion that we spent on COVID. And the politicians don't come to us and say, you know, we're going to charge you $24 trillion to shut down the country or to depose, you know, leaders abroad. They don't have the guts to do that. So what they do is they just go ahead and do it. They print the money and they bill us later through a stealth tax called inflation, which hurts the young, which hurts the poor, which hurts the elderly, anybody on a fixed income. But homeless, the, the price of homes has gone up higher and faster than anything else by orders of magnitude. Why is that? For example, the average price of a house two years ago in this country was $215,000. Today it's 415,000, and the interest rates have gone from 3% to 7%. So if you're trying to get into a home, your first home, you're paying four or five times what you were paying two years ago. And even two years ago, you know, I have seven kids. One of them is 39, and he owns a home, because he, he beat the tsunami. He was in front of that wave. My other six kids all went to the best schools in our country. They went and they have great jobs. They're making a lot of money for their age. But none of them has any prayer of buying a home. None of them is making enough money to buy a home in the current ecosystem. So, and none of, none of their friends are. So we have a whole generation of kids who, you know, for whom the American dream is just a broken promise. And why is this happening? It's happening because, partly because of the inflation, but mainly because there's three giant corporations, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, who are the biggest companies in the world. And BlackRock, I have to say, does not buy single-family homes, but it's buying residential housing. And it, but it has a subsidiary called Blackstone that is owned by, Black, by Vanguard and BlackRock that are buying homes. And by the way, all these companies own each other. So it's really one giant conglomerate. And they own, collectively, 88% of the S&P 500. So they own all the business in our country. And now they want to own all the land. They're buying the agricultural land, and they're buying up the single-family homes. They've already, uh, corporations already own about 6% of single-family homes. And that marginal purchase ownership of the homes is what's driving up the cost. And they're on trajectory, if we follow the current trajectory, within six years, they're going to own 40 to 60 percent. And we're going to go from a ownership country to a rental nation. And when that happens, we go from citizens to being subjects. Because if you own a home, you care about your community you're investing in. You care about your schools. You care about your hospitals your health care, you care about the police, you care about the appearance of your property, you care about your neighbors, you go to the PTA meetings, you go to the planning board, you're, in, you're part of that community, you're part of that democracy. And more importantly, you have an entree to the American capitalist system because you are able to borrow money on that asset, you have equity, so you can get a second mortgage. And if you have an entrepreneurial impulse, you have the money to pursue it. So you can, you know, you can, you can start a small business, you can buy something small like a sewing machine, or you can bet the whole ranch and buy a restaurant or a retail outlet and you can build something for yourself. And I lived at a time that economists call the Great Prosperity, which I spend most of my youth, which is a 50-year period after World War II, 
when the American middle class became the greatest economic engine in the history of mankind. When my uncle was president, I was a 10-year-old boy. We owned half the wealth on the face of the earth in our country. We were the biggest exporter of goods. We were also a moral authority across the globe. And uh, everybody wanted our products, from blue jeans to transistor radios to RCA Victrolas to, uh, to American automobiles. And we, today, that's gone. We've gone, we're, we're going, and, but, but it was the, the, the thing that launched the great prosperity was immediately after World War II, we had these, we passed these laws like the GI Bill that got an entire generation of young people into homes. And they were able then to follow their, their entrepreneurial instincts and ambitions, and they were able to build businesses. We had this ferment of middle-class businesses in this country. And today, um, that's gone. And today, you know, we have, today the average income in this country is $5,000 less than the cost of basic human needs, of food, transportation, and housing. And I'm not talking about good food. I'm not talking about Whole Foods. I'm talking about the lousy food that you buy at your local grocery store, where you need eight, to eat eight carrots today to get the nutrition of one carrot when I was a kid, and where there's all kinds of glyphosate and atrazine and neonicotinoid pesticides and all of that stuff that we're feeding our kids. So that all contribute to this explosion of chronic disease. So, um, so if you buy the bare minimum of what you need to survive, you're the average American. You owe $5,000 at the end of the year. How are people handling that debt? They're putting it on their credit cards. And about a month ago, we hit this milestone in this country of a trillion dollars in private credit card debt. Nothing like that's ever happened. It's $330 billion added over the last three years. And how are, and, and the, the companies that own that debt are Visa, MasterCard, Citibank, Wells Fargo, Chase, and Morgan. And they're charging 22% interest minimum. Oh, I had a commercial fisherman friend who sent me a screenshot of his credit card bill about two weeks ago. 37% interest. Oh, if the mafia did that, it would be called loan sharking, and they would go to jail. But if Visa, MasterCard, and the others do it, it's just business as usual. Who do you think owns every one of those companies? Uh, BlackRock. BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. Oh, uh, so they're doing it right in front of us. They're just strip mining the wealth from the American people. They're, it's legalized theft. It's legalized larceny, and they're doing it because the control that that money gives them. BlackRock has a, a, a has ten trillion dollars under management. Oh, that the, the state of California has a GDP of three trillion. So BlackRock is more than three times the state of California. It is the third largest economy on earth after China and the United States. The head of BlackRock is a guy called Larry Fink, and he says that um, he, he's, part of, he's on the board of the World Economic Forum in Davos. So he's part of the Billionaires Boys Club and meets every year in Davos to try to you know, design the future for the rest of humanity. And they call that future, this is their name for it, the Great Reset. And when Klaus Schwab was asked, what does the Great Reset mean in one sentence, he said, it means you will own nothing, but you will be happy. So they're on their way to achieving at least the first part of that, and the second part is up to us. And, you know, we're living at a time, you know, I'm running against two presidents, both been president for a term, and both of them are running on this, I, this idea that they brought great prosperity to our country. And, you know, I spend a lot of time sitting at kitchen tables with regular Americans. I've done this over the past six months of campaigning, but I've been doing it my whole life. 
because I represent people in big lawsuits who've been harmed by corporations and by corporate capture. So today, I'm representing a thousand people in Columbiana County, Ohio, from East Palestine, whose lives were upended by the Norfolk Southern spill. I represented 10,000 people on the Ohio River who's, who were poisoned by C8, by PFAS and PFOAs um, from uh, DuPont. And they, uh, they made a movie about my case called Dark Waters, starring Mark Ruffalo. I represent another 10,000 in, in uh, Spelter, West Virginia, who were poisoned by a DuPont zinc smelter there. Oh, I sit at kitchen tables with people, and I see people making choices that I never dreamed Americans would have to make. I see elderly people, talk to elderly people who are cutting their prescription pills in half so that they can afford food. Who I talk to um, mothers who are, who are downgrading the ingredients that they purchase at the grocery store to make it through the checkout line. I talked to a young kid uh, in New Hampshire the other day who told me that every Tuesday he has to make a decision about whether to buy, to uh, get a meal or to buy, to fill up his car with gas for the week. And a young couple who told me they had an argument sitting in their living room in a rental flat that they can no longer afford, 48% because of the pressure on the housing markets, 48% of Americans don't believe that they'll be able to continue to pay their rent. This was one of those young couples and they, they talked about an argument that they had well, a heated argument, sitting in the living room with a baby sitting in their lap crying and having to decide, debate whether that baby is $50 sick or $100 sick or $1,500 sick before they bring them to a hospital. These are choices Americans shouldn't be making. And 57% of Americans could not put their hands on $1,000 if they have an emergency. And that means, you know, for if you're in that cohort, and the engine light comes on in your car, it's the apocalypse. Because you know you can see your life circling the drain. You know you're not going to be able to pay that mechanic and that your car is going to die. You're not going to be able to get to work. And you're going to lose your apartment and you're going to end up on the sidewalk like all those people in San Francisco who weren't mentally ill and they weren't drug addicts. They just had bad luck. They had an engine light come on. They had two flat tires at the same time, and they ended up on that sidewalk. And that's where this whole generation can now see themselves. You know what it's like when, when the, the, the fuel gauge on your car is on empty and how that focuses your mind, how it makes you stupid. You can't, you can't think of anything else. It lowers your IQ. Because you're just wondering, am I going to make it to that gas station now? throw two kids in the back seat of the car to amplify your anxiety, and now you're, ri you're riding through a bad neighborhood. Well, that's how half of America is waking up every day, with that sense of impending doom, and not seeing how there could possibly be a good ending. And this is not the way that, you know, young people are supposed to be viewing their prospects. My kids are worried about, they, they don't think about even buying a house. They're worried about their college debt. You know, our generation told them, you've got to go to college. And now they've come out of college and the jobs are not enough to, do, to, to run their lives, much less pay that debt that's landed on them. Oh, it's been a betrayal of this generation. And uh, I, um, you remember, it, the other thing is about this generation, this generation lived through the COVID pandemic. And they watched... They had to make the sacrifice for the older people. That's what they were told. If they had to have, you know, they had, to, they had to homeschool. They missed that experience. They had, they had you know, they were, we're seeing this generation of kids that all need remedial education. They didn't get that experience. And then they, uh, we closed down 3.3 million businesses without any due process, with no scientific citation with no uh, notice and comment rulemaking, no environmental impact statement, all the things that government is supposed to do before it asks us to make a sacrifice, none of that happened. Democracy was just one guy, a 50-year bureaucrat who never won an election, 
who just said, everybody shut down your house, and two presidents went along with him and got rolled by a bureaucracy. They never said to him, show me a scientific study that justifies this. And, uh, and Amazon, who I'm suing right now, <laughs> oh, Amazon, I'm suing them and, and Elizabeth Warren because she told them to, to censor a book that I had written with, not my Fauci book, but another book that I wrote with Joe Mercola. That was, um, that was critical of the, of the lockdowns. And uh, so Amazon censored it. So, and Amazon was the one business that they didn't close, right? We all got a three-year lesson, and uh, Amazon got to help close down all of its competitors. And we got a three-year lesson on how to use Amazon. Oh, I didn't know how to use Amazon before the pandemic. Right. And, and by the way, it's a magical experience. As I tell you, you just find a picture of something that you like and you hit send and it's in your driveway in you know, 24 hours. Oh, but what happened? We closed down all these businesses. 41% of black owned businesses will never reopen. And you know, there was, a, there was that, that convenience was seductive but there was a cost to it that we're paying now as a nation, which is we closed down all the local retailers, the people in this, I'm sure all of you know somebody who closed the business won't reopen. They were paying local taxes here. They were the people who had the, the plaque of gratitude on their, on their wall from the local Boy Scout troop. They were the people who paid for my kids' hockey jerseys. They paid for their Little League uniforms. The money we were giving them was more. And I give the same product from Amazon, but that money was staying in our community and recirculating and making it enriching us all. And that guy is gone today. And, but Amazon, at least, they're paying local taxes here, right? No. No, they're not. But at least they're paying federal taxes, right? Right, last year they paid zero. So like I said, they're doing it right in front of us. They are strip mining the wealth and the equity from our nation, from the middle class. During the lockdowns, we shifted $4 trillion north from the American middle class to this new oligarchy of billionaires. We created 500 new billionaires, a billionaire a day in 500 days of lockdown. And, um, and we destroyed the American middle class and the prospects for our children. And, um, and then, you know, we're still paying for the wars. So we spent, we spent $8 trillion on wars since 2001, since the Iraq war started. What do we get for that? Yeah, we right, 20, 23 veterans who are con committing suicide a day. Uh, 550,000 people who are homeless, half of them in California, which has 12% of the population, and that's coming our way. Oh, uh, and then, you know, Iraq is worse off than we found it. We killed more Iraqis than Saddam Hussein. Iraq today is hardly a nation. It's just a, it's just a battle zone between Shia and Sunni death squads. And we pushed Iraq into a proxy posture with Iran, which is exactly the foreign policy outcome we've been trying to avoid. We created ISIS. We sent two million refugees up into Europe and destabilized every democracy in Europe. We created Brexit. You know, that was a result ultimately of that influx of, of war refugees from our Iraq and Syria war. And the, uh, the current riots that are going on in France are a result of that. So that's what we got for $8 trillion. And now we're in Ukraine, $113 billion that we committed in March of 2022, $24 billion extra that we committed a month and a half ago. And now President Biden is back asking for another $60 billion. That's going to be $200 billion for a war that should have never happened a war that the Russians tried to settle twice on very, very beneficial terms to us, and we made Zelensky tear up the, the, uh, 
the agreements that they had signed with the Russians and the Russians were withdrawing. And Putin every day is issuing, asking to come to the negotiating table. And Zelensky, you know, with our uh, support, has said there's going to be no negotiation. So this is a war that they want, and it's a war ultimately of NATO. Why, why do we move? Why do we move uh, NATO east into 15? We want 15 countries. We moved them 14 countries. Why do we want to move them into 15 countries? Because when you when you designate a country as a NATO country, it has to conform its weapon systems to NATO specifications, which means certain companies benefit. They now have a trap market. Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Lockheed, General Dynamics. So they, you know, they're the ones who benefit from us moving NATO into all of these countries. So when we committed $113 billion in March, that month was a big month. We did something else. We cut food stamps to 30 million Americans from $283 a month to $23 a month. Try feeding yourself on $23 a month. We cut Medicaid to 15 million Americans, Medicare to 15 million Americans the same month. The same month, the Fed printed $300 billion unexpected to bail out the Silicon Valley Bank. So when the bankers need the money and when the military contractors need the money, the door to the safe is wide open. But when Americans are poor, when they're sick, when they're hungry, the door is slammed shut. And that month, um, uh, the Mitch McConnell was asked by a reporter on national TV. The reporter said to him, you know, Republicans are supposed to be concerned about the debt. We're now at $33 trillion national debt. Isn't this going to hurt our, 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 our efforts to curb the debt? And the Republican promised to do that. Mitch McConnell said, don't worry about it because we're not really giving this money to Ukraine. We're, um, the, the money really is going to U.S. military contractors. Oh, it's going to Raytheon and Northrop and General Dynamics and Boeing and Lockheed. So we just admitted it. And it's just a money laundering scheme to benefit them. I mean, he said that means it's good for our country. But really, is it good for our country? Or is it good for them? And who do you think owns every one of those companies? BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. Oh, and then Tim Scott, I, you know, who was on the last Republican debate. All the Republicans, just the same as this debate, they were all trying to outdo each other, except God bless them, Vivek. All the other ones were saying, yeah, we got to spend whatever it takes to win the Ukraine war. Then we're going to go after Mexico. Then we're going to go after China. And, uh, and we're going to go, you know, wherever we need to do new wars. So um, the, the, the MC, the woman who was uh, asking questions, asked the same question. She said, is this, you know, aren't, aren't we worried about the debt? And Tim Scott said, don't worry about the debt because it's not a gift to the Ukraine, it's a loan. So raise your hand if you think that loan's ever getting paid back. Right. So nobody thinks it's getting paid back. So nobody in the country thinks that. So why do they even bother calling it a loan? Well, they call it a loan because if you call it a loan, you can impose loan conditions. What are the loan conditions that we imposed on Ukraine? One, this extreme austerity program that makes sure if you're poor in Ukraine, you're going to be poor forever. Number two, this is most important, Ukraine has to put up all of its government-owned assets for sale to multinational corporations. So, and most important, it has to put up all of its agricultural land for its sale. Uh, Ukraine's agricultural land is the biggest asset in Europe. It is the richest agricultural land on the globe. It's the breadbasket of Europe. There's a joke in Ukraine that if you throw a boot on that land, 
something will grow that people can eat because it's so rich. There have been thousand years of wars fought over the control of that land. We now have 450,000 Ukrainian kids who have died to protect that land, to keep it in the control of Ukraine. And they probably don't know about this loan condition, which forces Ukraine to put all that land up to sale. 30% of it have already been sold. And who do you think the buyers are? Monsanto, DuPont, and Cargo. Who do you think owns every one of those companies? Uh, BlackRock. So, and the big, the big expense of Ukraine is just beginning because everybody acknowledges that the big money comes after the war when we get to rebuild all the stuff that we destroyed. And who do you think won that contract? BlackRock. So, like I said, they're doing it right in front of us and they don't even care that we see it anymore because they know they can get away with it. And how do they get away with that? How do they get away with this blatant destruction of all of our values of the American middle class? They get away with it because they have a strategy. And the strategy is to keep us all hating on each other. Keep Republicans fighting Democrats, blacks against whites, to seed and, and amplify all of this hatred everywhere that we go on the media that they own. We're, we're constantly being fed these messages. And if you look at the Republican debate, either of them, they talked about those, you know, culture war issues that are 40 years old. They're talking about the things that, that are important issues, but they're issues we know that nobody ever solves. They're just there to fight about with guns and abortion. And like I said, they're important issues, but there are so many other issues that we ought to be talking about and that we aren't because they want us talking about those issues that, uh, that make us hate each other. And, uh, and if the king and queen look out over the balustrades of their castle, and they see all of their subjects fighting each other, they go back to the banquet hall and they pop champagne corks because they know nobody is coming over the wall to get them and to take back what they've stolen. And what my purpose is over the next 12 months of this campaign and the eight years when I'm in the White House, is to end the fighting with each other between Republicans and Democrats and then lead everybody over that wall to take back our country and take back what the world says. And you know, so from the beginning of this campaign, I've gone around and tried to identify those issues, not the issues that keep us all apart, but the values that we all share in common. And what I found out is that confirmed and validated is that the things that we have in common are much bigger landscape than the little things that keep us apart. Everybody in this country, whether Republican or Democrat, everybody wants to take care of our veterans. Everybody wants to take care of our teachers and make sure they have good enough pay. Everybody wants to make sure that American children are the best educated children in the world. Everybody wants to end the chronic disease epidemic. Everybody wants, everybody loves regenerative agriculture. They want healthy food. They want to get the poisons out of our food. And, and everybody wants a clean environment. So if all you do is talk about climate change, you're going to stir up a lot of anger. Because people have to believe these lines on a graph. And, you know, I consider it a crisis, but I don't insist anybody else to. Because I know it's one of those issues that is just used to drive us apart. But if you start talking about habitat loss, about protecting sacred places, about ending the toxic contamination and exposures to our children. Everybody agrees when we were fighting against 
the Flint, Michigan poison water, we had Hell's Angels shoulder to shoulder with urban black leaders. People come to, when I did Standing Rock, you know, people came to Standing Rock from every demographic in our country and demonstrated because we didn't say, characterize it as a climate issue. We said it's about protecting sacred places. If you argue against, you know, carbon energy, people are going to be angry. But if you talk about the Appalachians, out there, you know, the, 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 the most important landscape in our country, the richest landscape in our country that now we've, we've blown up, we explode the Massey Energy Console and Peabody detonate enough ammonia nitrate explosives every week. It's like a Hiroshima bomb every week to blow the tops off the mountains to get at the coal seams beneath. And they have flattened an area larger than the state of Delaware. They've cut down the 500 biggest mountains in West Virginia. They buried 2,200 miles of rivers and streams. They poisoned off virtually all the water in the state. Americans don't want that. They want to protect our Purple Mountain Majesty. But if you just talk about it as a climate issue, it just makes people angry. But if you talk about it as habitat and protecting our water, our air, our Purple Mountain's Majesty, everybody wants that. Everybody wants to end the warfare state. Nobody wants eternal wars in our country. And everybody wants to end this corrupt merger of state and corporate power. And nobody else is talking about these issues. They're all talking about... They're, they're all talking about these tribal issues that we've been programmed to fight over rather than talking about the issues that will bring us together but will bring down, you know, the, the oligarchs that are and elites that are, uh, that are destroying our country, that are corrupting our values, that have, that have poisoned our government, that have turned the regulatory agencies into predators against the American people, that have transformed them into sock puppets for the industries they're supposed to regulate. And I feel, you know, I ran for president, made this decision to run because I felt like I was in a unique position not only to communicate these things to the American public, but also to fix them. Because I've spent 40 years litigating against these agencies. And I've sued almost all of them. I haven't sued the Fed yet, but, um, you know, I've, I've got them in my sights. Um, but I've sued DOT, and I'm litigating against them now. I've sued US, USDA, the Department of Agriculture, was created to protect small family farmers in this country and to ensure a wholesome food supply to the American people, and it does exactly the opposite. It's, on, it's basically just a wholly owned subsidiary of Monsanto and Cargill. And the other big, you know, um, uh, petroleum-based agriculture and just soil destruction and food poisoning and the commoditization of food, rather than giving us food, their farmers are producing commodities. And nobody wants that. We want our America back. And that's what I am going to give you. I love this country. You know, I litigated against FCC. I just won a case in the Court of Appeals against FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, for lying to the American public about the dangers of cell phone radiation. Yeah. I've done. I've sued CDC repeatedly and won. I've sued EPA repeatedly and won. NIH, FDA, all of these agencies. And when you litigate against them, it's like getting a PhD in corporate capture. You understand who the individuals are in these agencies who are causing the problem, the perverse incentives that put agency capture on steroids, the, um, the structures of the agencies and the way that they're transformed into, into vehicles for protecting the public interest to, to instrumentalities of private profit, of, of protecting the mercantile interests of the big companies they're supposed to be protecting us against. And, um, 
And, you know, so I know that I can fix it, and I can fix it fast. And I, but I can't do it alone. I need an army. I need your help, and particularly, I need your help now getting on the ballot in each state. The, the, the Democratic and Republican parties are going to try to prevent me from getting on the ballot. We have, we have 250,000 volunteers now. We are getting bigger crowds than any of the other presidential candidate, with the exception of Donald Trump. And we are already way ahead of our, our metrics for getting on the ballot in the states where we are legally permitted to go after them, the states like Maryland. We're, we're double where, we should, where we're supposed to be at this time. So I know we can do it, but we need a lot of help, and we need you to do it. And so I'm asking you to sign up tonight um, make sure that you sign a petition for ballot access, and if you're willing to help us on this, on getting ballots in Georgia and South Carolina, please sign up tonight. And I want to ask you to do something else. I have one of the reasons that I do so well with young people is that of people under 45, is that people under 45 are not getting their news from the mainstream media. Um, <laughs> I honestly, I honestly don't know if my children have ever seen an evening news broadcast. <laughs> and they're very well informed. But they get their money, they get their, their, their uh, information from what we used to call unconventional sources. They get it from listening to podcasts. And they get it from social media and a lot of alternative media. So, and that's why I'm doing so well in those groups. And independents who are critical thinkers do the same thing because they're looking at unconventional sources of information. And, but if you, if the only source of information that you have is MSNBC, CNN, and the New York Times, well, if I was living in that information bubble, I would have a very low opinion of myself. Because you're not going to hear anything good about me in any of that. You're going to hear a lot of defamations, a lot of mischaracterizations, and a lot of things that just aren't true. And what we find is that when we can convince those people to watch a podcast, to watch a Joe Rogan's, or Jordan Peterson, to watch me on it, to watch Tucker Carlson, to watch Aubrey Marcus, or one of those long-form interviews, that they have a very, very high and very quick conversion rate. And people say, oh, he doesn't have horns and a tail. He actually sounds like he's common sense. So what we need to do over the next 12 months is get a critical mass of those baby boomers to watch those podcasts and to look at other forms of information, which you know there's this kind of tribal religious uh, orthodoxy that says if you even suggest you know, an alternative that you're a dangerous person. We have to break through to those people. And so what I'm asking you to do is to go to where a, a, some of our merch, there's these guys out here who are selling great merch. We don't make any money from them. I wish we had that idea, but it's, it's really good merch that they have. Or get it from our, from our campaign. You know, go on the Kennedy 24 website, wear a button, wear a cap, wear a shirt, a t-shirt, or a sweatshirt, put a bumper sticker on your card, pick up tonight a lawn sign, and give my campaign visibility. And then what's going to happen is, what you know, most people who are wearing the merch will tell you is that you get a lot of thumbs up and a lot of high signs. And occasionally, maybe once a day, somebody comes up and says, why are you for him? Isn't he crazy? And you can say to them, just look at 10 minutes of this video. And, uh, and the conversion rate is enormous. Uh, we need people to go out from each one of these rallies. And, it, you know, if you believe in this campaign, if you want to be part of the Army, the uniform is wear something or display something and engage people and try to convince them to look at other sources. And we only need to get a little, a few of those baby boomers, 15 or 20 percent, and we win. So, um, so I'm asking all you energetic young people, stand up for your generation, 
let's, you know, I want, I want to give you back the American dream. If you elect me president, I'm going to make you my priority. You're going to get back your country. Again, I want to thank all of you for being here. And uh, can I get the, can I get the uh, ballot, the petitioners uh, up here? I think there are six of them here. Can I get you all up here? And maybe Nick can come out up with a, with a, is Nick here? Okay. Here they come. Yeah, and let's do questions. And while we're doing questions, if the six of you can come up here. They might have to go around. So they have to go around. Yeah. We have a mic up here for anybody who wants to okay, ask questions. Okay, if you have a question, raise your hand. Hello, Bobby. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I just, my question is, um, I'm sure you're aware, but... Uh, <laughs> All right, here we go. Anywho, uh, well, antibiotic, antibiotic resistance is a growing issue in the United States. Um, pharmaceutical companies are corrupt, and uh, they're essentially unwilling to develop any new antibiotics because it doesn't profit them. Um, so when you become elected president, what are you going to do to uh, keep the antibiotics being effective in the future? Uh, you know, that's been a concern. The, the question is about antibiotic resistance. It's been something I've been speaking out against for many, many years, and, and probably uh, the worst uh, contributor to antibiotic resistance is the use in CAFOs, in concentrated animal feeding operations, of subtherapeutic antibiotics. And what the farm industry, industrial farming, factory farming, has learned is that if you give animals subtherapeutic ana antibiotics, in other words, under the therapeutic level, it kills certain fauna in their stomach that affects their digestion and it makes them gain weight very, very fast. So there's this practice of giving commonly prescribed antibiotics in subtherapeutic levels to farm animals in concentrations. Now, if you wanted to do the worst thing imaginable, in terms of breeding antibiotic superbugs, that would be it, because you've got a lot of crowded animals in one place in filthy conditions where they're surrounded by sewage, which are breeding vectors for new types of bacteria. And you're exposing the bacteria to low enough levels that they can adapt and, uh, and, uh, and develop superbugs. And then when you start giving these same antibiotics to humans, you find out that they don't work anymore. They don't work against MRSA. They don't work against uh, Streptococcus or any of the... And I have a friend who's in the hospital, went to the hospital last night, a guy who is working on the documentary of my campaign, who is now hospitalized and with his, you know, potentially his life in danger because of an antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And, you know, it's insane what we're doing. It should be illegal, and I will do everything I can to make sure that that is regulated and is, becomes illegal. You don't, we don't give subtherapeutic antibiotics, and the overuse of antibiotics, um, you know, uh, we, we overuse it for, for everything, for earaches, for kids, for all of these things. What we find is that the kids who are exposed to it are less healthy over the long term that our bodies are meant to, um, to be exposed to illnesses and germs and then to recover, and that actually fortifies and strengthens our immune system. We, have, we need science-based medicine. We need evidence-based medicine. And instead of, you know, instead, of, uh, instead of medical policies that are, are designed to advance the, the profits of the pharmaceutical industry, which what we, is what we have now. Next question oh. here. Uh, can we, can you guys all kind of stand up here so everybody can see you? And Nick, will you introduce everybody?
Stephanie, can we, we have do time some for a questions? few more questions and then selfies. Oh. Thank you so much. I'm uh, with the press. How do you feel about being the first Kennedy that might make a Democrat lose the presidential race and then possibly make Trump win? I don't know. I intend to win myself. Okay, the next question over here. So you touched on the tragedies of uh, all these mountains in West Virginia being blown up for coal, poisoning the water, which is one of the most horrible things I can imagine. So my question is, how do you feel about nuclear energy? What I always say about nuke is that <clears throat> I'm all for it if they can make it safe and if they can make it cost effective. I'm for free markets and right now, the, um, it doesn't meet either of those metrics, and I'll, I'll just explain, you know, very briefly why. Um, it, I, I, the cost of a nuclear power plant, the cost of a solar plant in this country today, and I built, uh, I was, I, I, you know, I helped build two of the biggest nuclear, two, the two biggest, largest nuclear or solar power plants in this country. The cost of construction, the just construction costs are a, a billion dollars a gigawatt. So um, that, and then it's free energy forever uh, because the electrons are hitting the earth for free. The cost of building a nuclear power plant is about $14, trillion, $14 billion a gigawatt. Oh, so, you know, you could, you could make energy by burning prime rib if you wanted. Well, why wouldn't you use the cheapest way to do it? And, you know, they have to make it safe. And right now, it's not. And it's not me saying it's not safe. It's the insurance industry. There's not a single nuclear power plant in this country that can get an insurance policy or anywhere in the world. We had to, the insurance industry has said to them, these are people in black ties in Wall Street from AIG, Lloyds of London, who said, we're not going to write you a policy because you're too dangerous to insure. So until they, so they had to go, the industry had its lackeys on Capitol Hill in the middle of the night in a sleazy legislative maneuver, um, passed the Price-Anderson Act, which immunizes uh, all nuclear power plants from, from, from lawsuits or for failure. 
or for you know any kind of accident. So my home, I'm a homeowner. My home has, if, on the small print of its my insurance policy, it says this does not insure you against radiation contamination from a nuclear power plant, either accidental or deliberate. Oh, I'm against that immunizing, you know, industries, whether it's the vaccine industry or nuclear power plants, to make them not accountable for their own behavior. Oh, um, and by the way, there's not a single utility that will construct a nuclear power plant unless 100% of the costs are shouldered by the taxpayer. So you're building it. They aren't. They are not going to risk their own money on it. Then the operations, there's operation maintenance outages all the time. And they then have the, uh, they then have the, they have to get the uranium, you know, which is very expensive and they have to be, it has to be mined. And then they have to store their waste for 30,000 years, which is five times the length of recorded human history. So if you force them actually to pay their cause up front, which we ought to be doing, uh, nobody would ever touch one of them. So, you know, I say let's, let's, let's use the cheapest form of energy possible. Let's end the subsidies. We give $5.2 trillion in subsidies annually to carbon. Let's end those subsidies. Let's end the subsidies to everybody and make everybody survive on the market. And when we do that, we're going to have the most efficient forms of energy, and the most efficient are the ones that are least wasteful and least polluting. If they had to internalize the cost of pollution, if the coal, coal industry pretends that it's cheap, because they say, look, we're only 16 cents or 11 cents a kilowatt hour, 16 cents depending on where you are. North Carolina, it's 11 cents a kilowatt hour. They say, look, we're the cheapest form of energy, but they're not telling you that they're also poisoned every freshwater fish in America with mercury poisoning. And the health care costs to the American people are enormous. And that should be internalized by the industry. They have, um, they have destroyed the forest cover on the high peaks of the Appalachians from Georgia to northern Quebec um, from, from acid rain. They have... Uh, they, have, they cause about uh, 500 billion in, in respiratory injuries a year, asthma attacks, et cetera, from ozone and particulates. They, you know, I grew up in the Adirondack Mountains, which is the oldest protected wilderness on Earth. The American people had a right to believe that that wilderness area would be sacrosanct and protected forever. But one out of every five lakes in the, Apple, in the Adirondacks is now dead, sterilized from acid rain. Oh, and what we're seeing now on the coastline where I grew up, you know, in Cape Cod, is the oyster fisheries have collapsed, the shellfish, all the bivalves are collapsing because the water is now uh, so acidified, the salt water, the ocean, that the bivalves cannot mobilize calcium out of the water column to make their shells. So those are injuries that the industry ought to be internalizing. And if they had to do that, coal would cost, you know, cost five bucks a kilowatt hour, and nobody would be buying it. What I say, you know, you show me a, a, a pollution, and I'll show you a subsidy. I'll show you a fat cap using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay his production costs. That's what all pollution is. So, Mr. Kennedy, I just want to preface by saying this. Many people can read statistics off a sheet. Only few can truly fight for their ideals. But you, sir, have perspective when it comes to fixing this country, and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. So the question I would like to ask, the question I would like to ask is, for those that are young, that can't quite be president yet, but still want to make a difference in their state, fighting the corruption in politics, what advice would you give? Join the campaign. Sign up at Kennedy24.com, and I hope to see you on the barricades. On the wall. Thank you very much. What's your name? Jonathan Thomas Bruce. Good to meet you. I hope our paths cross. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, one last question, then we're going to do selfie. It's, oh, it's uh, more of just a comment. It's about housing. I'm a retired California realtor, 
and I watched as this whole thing has exploded. And a big thing that is different here in South Carolina is if you're owner-occupied, you pay much lower property tax. You pay five times as much if it's non-owner-occupied. If California would just implement that, it would really slow down the housing crisis. They don't keep people, help people in their houses longer. If we had lower tax, so I don't know if there's some way you could just implement that throughout the country. What we will look at it, we're looking at every good idea on housing. You know, one of the things, one of the many things you can read about on our website is that uh, one of the, the things, that, the reforms I'm going to do is I'm going to create a 3% mortgage payment for young people, for first-time home buyers. And the way I'm going to do that is not by raising the debt to finance it, but by selling a new class of T-bills at 3% tax rates, and the market will pay for it. You know that if you have a rich uncle who will close on your mortgage, you can get a much lower rate. Now, BlackRock and Blackstone, have, they are paying, in some cases, 30% less for money than the person you know with the best credit rating in the country because the cost of money is so low to them. And your kid now has to compete against them for the cost of money, and that's why you hear all these stories of somebody going to put a contract on a home, to purchase a home, to, to go into escrow, and at the last minute, somebody comes along with a cash offer that's 20% higher than the asking price and sweeps that up, takes that home away from you. And then you say, well, who was this person? And it turns out to be an LLC with an ambiguous name. And then if you follow the, the breadcrumbs, it takes you back to Blackstone, Blackrock, Vanguard, and State Street. And they'll be able to do that because they're paying less for interest rates than anybody else. So they can outcompete the whole market. What I'm going to do is, one, fix the tax code to make it less beneficial for corporations to buy single-family homes but also, and to, to make them competitive but also to offer these 3% mortgages. You know, if you, like I said, if you have a rich uncle, you can get a much cheaper rate because the bank is basing your interest rate on, not on your lousy credit rating, but on your uncle's great credit rating. Well, I'm going to give everybody a rich uncle, which is Uncle Sam. By getting Uncle Sam to co-sign the, the mortgage rate. And we did this with, with uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac on a limited basis. And guess what? And then if you default, the government owns your home. And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac now have a $100 billion surplus from selling those homes. So, um, and I'm going to use that money to make housing cheaper, but I'm going to give this 3% mortgage starting out with teachers, but also young people are getting in the homes for the first time so that everybody can get into a home. Thank you all very, very much, and I'll see you out here in a minute. Let's give it up for the future president of the United States, Robert F. Kennedy, Jr.